All right, welcome everybody to our next session of our Williamson County Farming Fundamentals session. We're really excited tonight to have a, a great speaker um, and a next great session to our class. As we move through kind of some of the business related marketing side, um, tax planning, things like that, that helps set up our businesses. If a business is what you're looking to do, uh, obviously a lot of us are on here because we're trying to find out what our next little hobby might be or our next little passion. But uh, right now we're gonna work through some of the business sides and um, one of the most important ones, if you're looking to do a hobby business or you're looking to do a full on business or if you're just looking for some help maybe in your own personal life is it's tax season. And so getting a little idea and having an idea before you get into the business is even better uh, for tax planning purposes. So Taylor and I are, are very fortunate to have a, a great guest speaker tonight. Erin Bell is our guest speaker. She is one of our area farm management specialists uh, for the University of Tennessee system. And Erin uh, hopefully can clarify exactly which county she covers because I can never remember exactly which areas each one of them covers. Unfortunately, Erin is not in, in our area for Williamson County, but she covers many of the, the counties that surround us. So uh, if you were in one of those counties, you know, it'd be a good opportunity to see Erin and meet Erin and be able to realize the, the resource that she is. But we're very fortunate to have a lot of the area farm management specialists, uh, less humble as ours in Williamson County. Uh, but they're such a great resource for so many different aspects uh, beyond just whether it's tax basics or anything like that. So uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Erin and let her introduce herself, kind of cover some of the counties that she covers and some of the different areas that, that area farm management specialists cover, and then let her get into uh, taxes. Okay. Thank you, Erin. Well yeah, no, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks for asking me to come on here um, and speak. So first question, Matt, you can just tell me, can you see my screen? We can. We, have, okay. we have put that as a default question to every Zoom session that's ever been started. <laughs> I know, technology is not always my friend, so perfect. Um, but like you said, my name is Erin Bell. Um, I am with the Center of Farm Management and um, there are roughly seven of us across the state. We kind of split the um, state up. You all have Les Humple. He is absolutely wonderful. I use him as a resource all the time. Um, I cover kind of the north central part of the state. So I cover from Davidson up to the Kentucky line, east to Sumner, and then all the way west to Benton County. So if you're in any of those counties, um, I am your managed specialist and don't mind helping you talk through some things. Um, but like he said, so tonight we're gonna talk about taxes, specifically record keeping for taxes. Um, and I know in a class this size, especially with farming fundamentals, since it's targeting you know new and beginning farmers, I may have some of you in here who have never seen a Schedule S and some of you may have been filing for a few years. So I'm really gonna try to um, cover the basics but then also get into some details for some of you that may have more experience. Um, and also just a big, before I dive into this, a big thanks to Taylor and Matt for hosting this kind of hybrid version of Farming Fundamentals um, I went to an in-person in Dixon just last week, and it was really neat getting to see all these beginning farmers coming together, asking each other questions. So as great as the content is of this course, um, you all as classmates are a resource to each other. So make sure to use that resource and get, and get to know each other. Um, Farming Fundamentals is also um, probably my favorite program that we do because I'm a beginning farmer myself. My husband and I, we bought our farm roughly five years ago. Um, we have learned through trial and error, uh, which is perfectly fine. We've learned a lot and I just think that's farming in general, but um, it's been quite an experience. So I just really appreciate this program being out there to kind of help those of us who are getting started. Okay, so anyways, we are gonna go ahead and dive into taxes. So, See if I can get my little clicker to work. All right, there we go. So um, again, we're gonna cover several topics involved with taxes. I'm gonna try to make it not too overwhelming because there's a lot that can go into taxes. But we're first gonna start by talking about tax forms for farmers. So 
your typical Schedule F and then your Form 4797. We're then going to talk about record keeping, why it's important, and some different record keeping tools out there that you all can use. Um, then we're going to dive into, if you're into saving money, we're going to talk about some general farm tax reducing tips. Um, we are going to briefly touch on auditors and what they're looking for, um, specifically for startup farms. Um, and again, we don't expect experience auditors much, but you do want to have some certain things in place in case the IRS does ask some more questions. And then we'll touch on some resources too that you all can use. All right, so I always have to put this little disclaimer out there um, when I'm giving a tax talk. I am not a um, licensed CPA or a tax preparer. So um, everything I talk about is for educational purposes and it is not legal or tax advice. Um, on the flip side of that though, if you are looking or will be looking for a CPA or a tax preparer in the future, I highly recommend that you try to find one that has farming experience. And the reason I say that is when it comes to taxes, specifically for farms, there are a lot of different little nuances, um, different laws that come with farms that are different from typical businesses. So having a tax preparer familiar with those and keeping up with those changes um, is probably gonna save you a bit of money. So um, do make sure to ask about that farming experience when you go looking for one. All right, so we're gonna start off by just talking kind of just about taxes in general, you know, looking at what tax bracket you're in, what are standard deductions. Um, so you can see up here at the top right, I have the different um, federal income tax brackets that you can be in. Of course, it starts at 10%, and then I've got it listed out, you know, what you can make up to if you're single or what you can make up to married filing jointly for each of those tax brackets. So you can see it goes from 10 to 12% and then up to 22%. That's if you're making roughly 90,000 if you're single or 180 married filing joint. Um, there are higher tax brackets. And if you're in one of those, you're doing great, keep going. Um, but I didn't list those out individually. But you know, I've, I've given this talk several times in person and a lot of people don't really know what tax bracket they're in. So I do like to show this on here so you can see for yourself. Um, now talking about standard deductions, this is what you can reduce your income tax with. So most people will just take the um, standard deduction. That is the one that you automatically get regardless of your itemization. So I got those listed out. If you're single, you can do a standard deduction of roughly 13,000. Married filing jointly is 26,000, and then head of household is around 19,000. Um, you can choose either to do a standard deduction and take these without any questions asked, or you can itemize your deductions out. However, you have to choose one or the other. So just make sure if you do decide to itemize your deductions that they are more than the standard deduction. If not, just take the standard. Um, next, I did just put something in about the child tax credit just because it did change um, quite a bit from um, 2021 to 2022. So for this past year, 2022, it was 2000 for anyone under the age of 17, which is quite a bit less than that 2021 year where we were looking at 3000 or 3600 So um, do be prepared for that. And there's no advance credit payments. They were kind of doing all that during the COVID um, years. Also, if you have, you know, other dependents, they're going to be about 500 as far as the credit towards you. So again, this isn't really farm taxes. These are just a few tax basics I always like to hit on before diving into farm taxes specifically. Um, and it is very important that you know what tax bracket you're in as far as the federal income tax, because that does come into play when we start talking about your Schedule S. Okay, so next we're going to dive into a couple of the tax forms that you will have to be um, familiar with if you are, you know, just getting your farm started or maybe you've had your land for a while and you're just going to start making some money off of it or spending money on it. 
Okay, so here, the first one we're going to start with is your Schedule S. This is your profit or loss statement from farming. Um, it's very simple. It's used to report all of your farm income as well as all of your farm expenses. All of that you will report on this form. Now, um, I always like to talk about what the IRS pulls from this form. Why do we have to fill it out? What taxes are they going to take out of it? So with the Schedule F, um, it is subject to federal income tax and self-employment tax. So if you're profitable at the end of the year, um, they will put a self-employment tax on that profit, which is going to be about 15.3%. What that covers is Social Security and Medicare. So if you think about it, when you're working for an employer, typically your employer will have that reduced from your income. However, since in this case with the farm, you are technically self-employed and your business is based off of your social security number. So they've got to have a way to pull that Medicare and that social security from your income. And that's how they do it is through the Schedule S. Also, federal income tax will be taken out of this. And of course, this depends on those tax brackets I showed um, earlier. So depending on the one you fall into, they will take that from this form as well. Um, so this is the most common tax form that you'll use. I do have the link to um, the IRS with this form on there um, in this presentation, and I sent this to Taylor earlier, so I'm sure she's going to share it with you. I've got a lot of um, links in this presentation, so you will have access to this, so you can just click on them and go look at it yourself. All right, so just taking a little bit of a bigger look at a Schedule F, and again, because this class is geared towards beginning farmers, I am going to get a bit detailed with it. Um, if you are very familiar with this form, just bear with me. But you'll see at the very top, you just simply put your name. You'll have to put your social security number. If you do have a business, if your farm is um, a LLC or a partnership, you have an EIN number with the IRS, you'll put that number here. If you do not have one, that is perfectly okay. There's kind of this false concept that you have to have a business in order to operate your farm. You don't. Farming is a little bit different than other businesses. So if you don't have an EIN number, that's fine. They're just going to base it off of your social security number, and that's how they're going to identify you. So um, do kind of keep that in mind if you're looking at starting a business. Um, don't be pressured to do an LLC or an S Corp or anything like that. You don't necessarily have to. Um, okay, so this next part is part one. This is going to be all of your farm income. So anything that you bring in from sales is going to fall in this first section. Part two beneath that, that's going to be all of your expenses. So anything that you spend on the farm for the farm, that is going to fall into one of these categories. And then you'll see here at the very bottom, you've got your total expenses. You'll take that out and that'll go to your net profit or loss, which is line 34. And again, based off of what's on that line 34, the IRS will choose how they tax you. So um, it is just one sheet, which is nice. We'll kind of look at these a little bit closer. So um, again, this is just that first part of the sheet, part one, just going up a little bit bigger. So one thing I want to point out about this form is if you notice, each of the categories already has its own line item number. Keep that in mind for record keeping. We are going to get into that here in a little bit, but it's nice that you already have categories you need to record keep for. The IRS has given that to you. So these different line items are what we need to make sure to keep up with specifically for taxes. So another thing I want to point out on this form, I really want us to focus on this line item one and line item two. Just because these are easily confused or just ignored, um, and it does make a big difference as far as the taxes that you're paying on it. So if you look at line item 1A, sale of purchased livestock and other resale items. So I'm just going to kind of come up with a simple example. Let's say you have a stand where you sell your tomatoes and um, corn, peppers, 
all these different things, but you purchase your eggs from a different farm. So let's say you sell the eggs for $6 to the customer, but you purchase the eggs for $3. If you list it here under line item 1A, you have the opportunity to take the cost of that item out on line item B. So of course you list how much, you know, let's say the $6 here on 1A, you drop down to 1B, put the $3. So you reduce that income that you're having to pay taxes on by $3. It's great, you can take that cost out. We run into a lot just where either people don't know or maybe they just get confused, but they'll try to list the sale of everything on line item two. But if you read this line item specifically, it's the sale of product or livestock that you've raised. So in this scenario, scenario, you see you list what you sold it for. Let's say it's the eggs, the $6 on line item two, and you have no opportunity to take that cost out. So instead of paying taxes on the $3, you're paying taxes on the six. So that's kind of the easiest way I can break that out, but you just really want to make sure, especially with record keeping, that you're separate, separating the items that you're buying and selling versus the items that you raise, because that's going to make a big difference on your taxes. That's really the only line item on here I want to get on the soapbox about, but um, it's just a mistake we see pretty often, um, especially when someone is new to the Schedule F form. All right, so hopping down to the farm expenses, same thing, you can see how everything is broken out into these different line items. I love how they have um, just different numbers to go with each category. For example, chemicals, you already know it's line item 11. Feed is line item 16, fertilizers and lime, line item 17. This makes it great for record keeping because again, they've already kind of chosen the categories for you. So again, all expenses for your farm are going to go on this section of the form. You'll pop down here. You'll take your expenses from your incomes. And again, there's that line item 34 where you're going to see your net farm profit or loss for the year. Okay, so again, that was Schedule F. Um, that is the main one you will use. It's the main one you'll have to get familiar with. But there is another one um, that I don't want to be left out. That is Form 4797. This is the sale of any business property. And those of you that have livestock or come from a livestock background, you may be familiar with this form. But um, if not, I do want to talk about it a little bit. So this is going to be this is going to house any sales that you do of your business property. Now, most of the time when people think business property, you're thinking, you know, long-term assets such as, you know, you go to sell a combine or a tractor. Those things will go on this form. But there is also something else that goes on this form that is overlooked fairly often. And that's going to be any breeding livestock that you keep as a long-term asset. So this can be horses, this can be cattle, this can be small ruminants. So if you look um, just a little bit down on this sheet, to be considered a long-term asset, you have to have, if it's cattle or horses, you have to hang on to them for 24 months, so at least two years, which most of us, you know, if we've got a good mama cow, we're going to keep her until, I mean, we can keep her up to 10 years or even more if she's doing a good job. So um, and then with other livestock, like your small ruminants, it's just going to be 12 months, so one year. But as long as you keep those animals for that time frame, they are going to be considered a long-term asset, which is wonderful for us because instead of putting the sale of them on Schedule S, we're going to put them on this form, Form 4797. What's nice about that is that this form is not subject to that self-employment tax of 15.3%, and it's not subject to federal income tax. How the IRS looks at this is anything you sell on here, that profit that you get from that animal is considered a capital gain. So they're going to use the capital gains tax rate, um, which of course that depends on the money you make off of it, but it's not going to be anywhere near 
that 15.3% or your federal income tax. So again, um, this is specifically for livestock, but we see a lot of people put these on Schedule F and they're paying taxes they don't need to pay. So we just always like to point that out. So I just took this form and made it bigger so you could see it. It's very simple. It's a lot like the Schedule F. So if you look at part one, we'll just start over here to the left, this section A. This is going to be where you put the description of your property of your property. So let's say you've got a um gosh, a 10-year-old um Angus cow. That's how you would describe her. You would then put the date that you purchased her, the date that you sold her, and then the gross sales price. So how much you sold her for. Then from there, what's also nice about this form is it allows for depreciation. Um, I'm not going to get into depreciation tonight just because that can get um, extremely detailed. So I'll save you from that. Um, but depending on what the item is that you're selling, there are different depreciations that you can account for. So you can depreciate her value. And then you can also put the cost of her basis. So if you purchase her, how much she costs you, you can take that out. And then you put your gain or loss, and then that's when they determine the capital gains tax that they're going to put on it. So again, this is just, yes, this is a form you need to be familiar with, but it's also a way to reduce your taxes versus putting her on Schedule F, where you're paying an income tax for her, for her full price that you sold her for, which is not exactly what you need to do. So um, do keep this form in mind, especially if you work with livestock, because it will, it will come in handy in the future. Okay, so I did just do a little summary here of um, if you have livestock, and I know not everyone in here is doing that, but when it comes to reporting, I kind of have these bolded out. There are four different ways you're going to want to keep up with your expenses based off of the animal that you have. So you want to separate your calves raised versus your calves purchased. And then you wanna separate your breeding livestock raised versus the breeding livestock that you purchased. This is gonna determine whether you put them on that Schedule F or that Form 4797. And then also remember on that Schedule F, whether you raised them or you bought and resold, it's gonna determine whether you put them on that line item one or two. So again, if you have a tax preparer that's maybe not familiar with farming, um, this is something good to bring to their attention just because it's one of those little details. If you don't know it, there's no way to know it. So um, it's just something good to talk to them about and for you to know personally. Okay, so we will go ahead and dive into record keeping. And I was going to say, because I know taxes can get... Um, confusing pretty quick. So if you have questions or if you think of things, go ahead and throw them in the chat box. I'll kind of keep my eye on it as I'm going through. Um, and if I can answer it while I'm talking, I will. Um, if not, I will just look at it at the end. But don't hesitate to throw something in the chat box as far as asking questions. All right, so record keeping. All right, so how do records affect your taxes? Why is record keeping so closely tied to our taxes? Well, um, it is handy for many reasons. Um, one is it's gonna help your tax preparer complete an accurate tax return. Again, kind of going back to those forms. If you've record kept correctly for those animals and for those items that you've bought and resold, that's gonna help your tax report be more accurate and hopefully save you money. Um, good tax records is going to reduce the cost of your tax return preparation. If you're all organized and you go in there and it only takes an hour, that's probably going to be a lot cheaper than if you go in there with a box full of receipts and it takes four hours. So um, that's another way to save a few dollars. Keeping up with your records throughout the year is going to help reduce the time you spend on tax return preparation, which that can seem Kind of opposite, because if you're having to keep up with records throughout the year, obviously you're spending more time on it 
But in my opinion, it's better to spend a little time on it throughout the year versus getting to February and trying to remember why you bought something last June. If you're like me, I can barely remember what a receipt was for last week. So um, that should save you some time there. And then I'm all about anything that can reduce my stress. So keeping up um, with your records is gonna help reduce that stress around tax time. If you feel prepared and you feel like you know what you're doing, your stress level is gonna go down. So I do wanna to touch on a little bit Yes, records are phenomenal for taxes, but that's not the only reason um, we keep up with records. So records also play a um, huge part in the health of your farm business as a whole. Um, one thing it's going to do, it's going to help you as managers make informed decisions. Um, it's going to provide a basis for you to create an accurate budget. Um, it's going to help you create accurate financial statements, which is um, incredibly important because if you're going in for any kind of, let's say there's a great grant opportunity out there, or you're going to farm credit for a loan or FSA for a loan, they're going to ask for these financial statements. It's also going to help you see where your money is coming and going from, especially if you have multiple enterprises. What I mean by that, let's say you've got a, a cattle operation and a corn operation, it's going to help you see what operation is making money, what operation is taking money. It gives you the ability to see your farm strengths and weaknesses, um, and then it's going to help you qualify for loans, grants, and funding opportunity. Uh, most of the time, if you're looking at like an ag enterprise fund, something like that, they're going to want a business plan and they're going to want records from you. So um, there are just many, many benefits to keeping up with your records. All right, so I like to describe the different types of records like two sides to an equation. So you've got your financial records on the left and you've got your production records on the right. They are both equally important. Um, a lot of times we'll kind of see people heavily focus on the production records, but not the financial ones, or vice versa. They focus on financial and not production. You've got to have health on both sides in order to have a successful operation. So what kind of falls under financial records? Well, these it's anything that pertains to income and expense transactions on the farm. It's going to be your sales, your financial statements your purchases, and then any budgets that you create. As far as production records, that can be anything that describes the quantities of um, input items on your farm and any other types of production measures, such as birth weight, calving rates, death loss, um, kind of switching from livestock more to crop, your crop yields, your fertilizer and seeding rates, and your planting and harvesting dates. So, You've kind of got both. You've got that financial and that production. So what are the benefits of both? We kind of already talked about the benefits of um, financial records, but I do want to touch on a few more with this. Probably the one that I believe is the most important, especially when you're just getting started, is knowing the true cost of production. And the reason I say that is in order to make a profit off of anything, whether you have a value-added item um, like honey or goat soap or some of these new ones coming about, you have to know what that item costs you in order for you to market it high enough for you to make a return and actually pay yourself as far as labor goes. A lot of farmers don't like to pay themselves and we're, we're trying to fix that even though I know it's hard. Um, so just calculating that break-even price and truly knowing what you put in that animal or that product. Um, it's also going to help you as far as calculating what you have available for cash as far as keeping up with what you need for your living expenses, what you need to keep up with maybe those loan payments that you have. Um, and it's another one is it's really going to help you improve the working relationship with your lender. Um, so again, having those good records showing that you're um, planning to make a profit that goes a long way when it comes to grants and um, lender opportunities. So as far as the benefits of production records, 
Um, it's going to help you track management decisions. It's going to help you figure out um, which girls need to go, which ones need to stay. So making good polling decisions, or if you're on the crop side, choosing the right variety. If you've got several that you're trying, knowing which ones are successful and which ones aren't are going to help you just really manage that production and choose the best variety that you can. Um, it's also going to help you plan for future changes and improvements to your operation. And again, kind of along with the lender relationship, it's going to help you qualify for government or disaster relief um, programs through FSA. So um, I just always like to say, you know, your financial records, that's going to help you decide where you need to shift production and your production records, that's going to help improve your financial health. So they really do work together. Um, so I just, even though my job is financial records, I always like to pull in production because I just truly believe they're both equally important. All right, so getting off of that, um, now we're going to look at a few methods of financial record keeping. I'm going to focus on taxes as far as record keeping in this, um, but each of these options other than the last one are um, really great for financial record keeping as a whole. I just made this a little bit more tax focused. All right. Oh, let me get this out of y'all's way. Okay, so as far as um, probably one of my personal favorites is Quicken. Um, it is actually what we use in our county offices. My favorite thing, I'm a little bit old school when it comes to record keeping. So I like Quicken because it's designed like a checkbook register. So when you open it up, it looks just like a checkbook would if you opened it up. So I like that. Um, again, just because I'm more of a paper to pen or pen to paper person, um, it works well with most farming operations. It's very flexible. It's fairly easy to learn because, again, it's just like a checkbook register. But what's nice about this is it has a lot of really wonderful built-in reports. It's going to save you time. It's going to save you um, energy, but it's really going to help you see the health of your business as a whole. So um, it can create financial statements for you, which, you know, we already talked about if you're going in for a grant or a loan, they're going to ask for these statements already. So it can generate your cash flow, your balance sheet, and an income statement for you. And then one of my personal favorites is it can also generate tax reports for you, which is amazingly handy, especially around tax season. And I'll show you what that tax report looks like here in just a minute. Um, it also has great organizing capabilities. So um, it allows for many different account types. For example, let's say um, you don't want to just keep your farm checking account in Quicken. You want to keep up with your personal checking as well. You can just create a new account for that. So you can use Quicken for both your personal and your farm life, which is nice. You can add as many checking or savings accounts as you want. It also allows for you to create your own categories. Again, kind of jumping back to that Schedule F, we saw all the different line items that Schedule F has you keep up with. You can go into Quicken and put in each of those line items as a category. That way, when you go in, let's say you put an income or an expense into the Quicken software, you can click what category it goes under. That way, at the end of the year, you pull up that category, total it up, and you can stick it right into your Schedule F. So that's another wonderful feature. You can create as many categories as you want, not just tax ones. Um, another great feature is it allows for tags. So it's called Tags and Quicken. But what that is, it's almost just like another subcategory. So I like to use tags for enterprise separation. So um, let's say, for example, you have a sheep and a cattle farm. What you can do is you can create a tag for each of those. That way, when you're putting incomes and expenses in, you can put which um, enterprise that money was coming from or going to. That way, at the end of the year, you can compare those two enterprises separately. Again, if you've got them all bundled, it's really hard to tell which enterprise is making you money um, and which enterprise is 
maybe just taking money from a different enterprise that you have. So that is also just a really wonderful feature that it has. Also, um, again, economics is my background, so I love being cheap, but it is fairly cheap. The deluxe version is only $35 to $52 annually, so um, it's definitely worth, worth that payment once a year. All right, so I'm going to show you all um, some examples just of some of the features that Quicken has. So this is um, the tax schedule feature. You can see they've got a lot of different schedules in here because, again, Quicken isn't just for farming. It's for other businesses as well. But the one we want to look at is that Schedule F. That's the main one we want Quicken to do for us. So what's nice with this is that it's going to list all transactions assigned to a category that is specifically tied to that Schedule F. What's probably the best use of this feature, because again, you still want a tax preparer looking at it, because Quicken isn't a tax preparer, it can just categorize things for you. What a lot of people do is they will let Quicken print out their Schedule F, then they'll take that to their tax preparer. That way, um, your CPA can look in that, it can double check those entries, make sure everything fell into the right category, and go on from there. So again, I wouldn't use this and just print this off and send it to the IRS, but I would use it as far as a guide that you can take um, to your CPA. All right, so here is a generated report from Quicken. So you can see here, this was a Schedule F run. And then if you notice, it's got the categories in bold. So you can see for the chemicals, which again is going to go on part two year expenses, it has totaled it up over here to $2,300. So you would put this amount on your Schedule F for that chemicals expense line item. Again, this was all um, generated by Quicken itself. So I just wanted to show you guys kind of what it would look like um, if you decided to run this report. So the other feature I wanted to show was um, the cash flow statement feature. Now this one, I have it um, separated out by enterprise. So again, um, if you look across the top, here are those categories. These list out all the categories here, and then up here are the tags. So you can see that this farm was a cow, calf, hay, and wheat farm. They've got some other tags in here like family living, but those are separate. So when they ask Quicken to generate a cash flow sheet by enterprise, they could then see how much their cow calf, oh, sorry about that, how much their cow calf operation brought in versus how much they spent on it. Same with hay. They could see how much it brought in versus what they spent. So again, kind of getting those tags separated out so you can see your different enterprises is very helpful, especially for future planning. All right, and if you're like me and if you're a um, visual person, Quicken does generate a lot of really beautiful graphs that you can look at. So all this is, it's very simple, but it's just um, expenses um, broken out into percentages. So you can see how much of your money is going into these different categories, but it's just it's nice that it can produce these visuals for those of us that prefer to see something like this. All right, so kind of getting away from Quicken, we're now going to look um, just briefly at QuickBooks. Um, QuickBooks is a lot like Quicken. It can do just as much as Quicken can. The big difference is that QuickBooks is more of a true accounting program. So if you're a bigger farm, um, that is going to hire multiple employees, you need to have the ability to do payroll. Quicken does not have that ability, but QuickBooks does. Um, so again, it can invoice and it can payroll where Quicken cannot. But again, this is more for businesses that are going to expand to the point where you're going to have employees. So this one is also not too expensive. Um, it is a bit more than Quicken, but it runs 200 to 250 annually. So again, if you think you're going to grow and expand to that level, um, QuickBooks would be for you. It can do everything Quicken can, just add payroll and a few more accounting programs to that. 
Okay, so we're also going to look at Excel. Um, I personally really like Excel, especially if you're just starting out and you're not quite ready to dive into Quicken and QuickBooks and all these other software programs. So um, I like Excel because you can do custom spreadsheet design. You can make it do exactly what you want it to do. You can make it look exactly how you want it to look. Um, do keep in mind, though, that in order to get Excel to do these things, you have to know the equations. You have to know how to program Excel. Um, and that, you know, if you don't mind to take the time and watch some YouTube videos, or if you already know how, that's great. Um, but you do have to know how to program it in order to do certain things. So it does have the ability to create graphs and charts, just like Quicken. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but it also can create financial reports for you. So um, it does have that feature as well. Another good benefit is that it's commonly known and used by most computer users. So if you're sharing this document with most people, they'll be able to open it and work on it as well. Whereas with Quicken or QuickBooks, they'll have to have the software. Um, and again, you can easily share files with your accountant or tax preparer. So I'll kind of show you um, just a few examples of some spreadsheets I created for a few farmers. Um, this one specifically was, I think she was in like her first six months of farming. Um, the taxes and keeping up with expenses and everything was kind of new to her. So she just came to me and asked, you know, I just want a simple form that I can go on and keep up with these things. I don't want it too complicated yet. So what I did for her, if you look kind of across the bottom, I've got each month listed out on its own tab. And the reason I did this is she had online banking, which most of us probably do. All she had to do at the end of the month was copy her bank statement, paste it into the spreadsheet. And then over here, she would go through her expenses and choose which tax line item it needed to go into. So I just created this little drop down box for her so she could choose the category. She didn't have to input any equations or anything like that. She just got to click the button and choose what line item it fell into. So she wanted to keep up with taxes, but she also wanted to keep up with her different enterprises. This was kind of a um, interesting farm. It was sheep and emu. Um, that was the first for me, but she wanted to separate those out and see what was coming and going from each. So all I did was create a drop down for her where she could just just like she could with her taxes, she could go through and choose which enterprise it came or went from. The last thing I'll show you um, that's fairly easy to do in Excel. So again, at the bottom here, you'll see all of the bank statements. I programmed it to where it would auto populate her cash flow sheet for her. Again, she didn't have to put any equations. That was something I just went in and did myself, but she could come look and see okay, what did my cash flow look like in January, February, to make sure she was bringing in enough to cover those family expenses and loan payments. So with all that being said, Excel is very fun because you can make it do exactly what you want it to do. But again, you have to have the time and the patience to put in those equations. Um, but do keep in mind that um, that is what Les and I do. Um, so if you want help setting up something like this, again, we kind of have them already created. We can just specify them to your farm and we don't care to share those at all. So seriously, feel free to reach out to me or less and we'd love to do this for you. Um, we love spreadsheets, so we don't mind playing with them. All right, so one of the last ones I'm going to talk about is pen and paper and you know, a lot of people knock pen and paper um, when it comes to record keeping, but what I've discovered is if pen and paper is what you're going to use, if that's what you're going to keep up with, I would much rather you do that versus having QuickBooks that you never open because that's not going to help you. So if you are a pen and paper person, that is perfectly fine. I've seen better records kept on paper than I have sometimes in QuickBooks. So just make sure if you are doing this method, you want to keep a running checkbook, make sure to keep up with all of your expenses and purchases and your incomes and your credits. 
Um, kind of the same thing with Excel. You can create your own categories and tags. Just maybe write them um, in the description of your checkbook. That would be perfectly fine. Um, do you keep a filing system of all of your receipts and invoices? One of the downsides to doing this is that it is going to take more time when it comes to tax reporting season, because again, it's not in a software that can auto populate all these reports for you. So do you kind of give yourself some extra time around tax season? Um, and again, just this little note, you know, it may not be as up to date as other methods. But if you use it, it's going to be way more effective than a software you never open. So um, I'm, I'm for pen and paper as long as you use it. All right, so I normally throw this in there when I'm making a jab at some of my cattle producers who I dearly love. But um, a lot of times when I'm riding it around in a truck with them, this is what their center console looks like. So, you know, as long as we're not doing this, I'm going to be happy. So. Really, the big takeaway as far as record keeping, choose what works for you. If that's pen and paper, do that. If that's QuickBooks, do that. If you're a do-it-yourself, um, you want to be creative and learn Excel, do that. So there's really no bad method. You just have to use the one that you're actually going to use. Erin, we have a few questions in the chat. I didn't know okay. if you to, to grab those. Yeah. Okay, let me look at um, the, the first one being uh, from Cade. Can calves raised be transitioned to breeding stock, i.e. a raised cow kept and bred for four years, then sold uh, yep. out of Form 4797? Yep, absolutely. They are, they're going to go on that 4797. Even though you raise them, it doesn't matter. They're still considered a long-term asset. Okay. And the next is if starting the first year, you calculate all expenses that have a big cost the first year or stretch it out over a certain number of years. And this would be more for their production, which is cut flower, farm, and veggies. Right. So, no, that's a fantastic question. I'm actually going to address that here in a little bit as far as farm tax reducing tips. Honestly, it's up to you and what works best for your operation. Um, you can depreciate those items over the year and take a cost, you know, depending on what it is over the next five or 10 years, or you can list all of those expenses in that first year. So it's kind of what you prefer. Great. And, and, and one more to get, get us caught up. And this is always the age old question is what's, what's too small, uh, when's too soon to start reporting uh, all these little things. Yeah, no, um, I totally get that question. I really like it. So no matter how small you are, even if you've got, you know, I've had some where they have, you know, little kids selling eggs on the side of the road and they're like, do I need to record keep for this? Um, if you plan on growing over time, go ahead and start now. Go ahead and start practicing those record keeping tools, those um, tips, get familiar with it. Um, there's really no size that's too small, in my opinion, because if anything, you're getting practice and that's going to help you in the future. Um, I had one lady who her daughter started and her daughter's like eight, you know, so it's a, a little girl. She started a little cut flower plot. And the next thing her mom knows, she kind of starts looking at the money and she's like, I think we actually pulled a profit from this. So now this year they're expanding. So you just you never know what's going to work. So I would just go ahead and start record keeping now. Thank you, Erin. I think we're caught up. Okay, awesome. And feel free to do that again, because sometimes I forget to look at the chat. <laughs> okay, so this next part, I'm going to try to go through fairly slow because it's, it's a lot all at once. And part of the reason I went ahead and put all this in there is you guys are going to get a copy of this presentation. So I'll touch it lightly but you can go back and look at it again. Um, and it's also a list you can take to your CPA or tax preparer. And again, not that they don't already know of these, but you just never know. Um, and some of these are too good to miss, to miss out on. And again, same thing, feel free to put questions in the chat box. And um, I'm sure Matt will grab me again if I forget to look at it. All right, 
So um, the first one is prepaying expenses. So that can be any expense that you saw in part two of Schedule F. So feed, fertilizer, seed, any of those things. So if, if you know you're going to have a high income year, you can go ahead and go purchase a lot of things that you may need for next year. Um, this will reduce the income tax that you have to pay for that year that you bought those items in. Um, but keep in mind, it has to be a purchase. It can't just be a deposit. So they're going to want to see that receipt. So again, if you had kind of an out of the ordinary, really high income year, you're worried about your taxes, you can go ahead and prepay expenses for the following year. Just keep in mind that if you do that, you're not going to be able to claim them on that following year either. So you kind of got to look at which one's going to benefit you the most. Another one, and this one kind of gets some laughs sometimes, but it's actually a really good idea, but paying kids under the age of 18. So the thought behind that, of course, you know, a lot of farms, their kids or grandkids that like to come work it. Maybe you've got some high schoolers who are interested in working the farm. Um, you can pay kids under 18. The benefits of doing that is there's no self-employment tax when you do that. It reduces your income tax because, again, that's an expense that you can take out. And it's transferring income to children who are going to be in a way lower tax bracket than you because they're not out there in the workforce yet. Um, the thing with that is the duties have to match the age of the child. So, um, and believe it or not, I have seen this pop up, but, you know, if the IRS sees that you're paying your five-year-old son $30,000 a year to work your farm, they're probably going to come call or knock on your door. So, so don't do that. But if you have, you know, kids that are 10 plus that are working your farm, um, this is a great way to help them and help you at the same time. Um, another thing is number three is income averaging. So if you've got a high income year, you can spread that income to the previous three years. So let's say the previous year you were in a lower tax bracket, you can shift that income back to those years and that'll save you in that current year of paying such high taxes. Um, so you're basically just shifting income to a lower tax bracket. I did put, you know, you use a Schedule J for that. You're definitely going to want an accountant to help you with that, um, but it will reduce that income tax level for you. So again, it's, there's a lot of benefits to farm taxes, um, a lot of different and creative things you can do to help lower your taxes. Okay, so something else, and this is kind of um, refers more to our, our larger farm, so I don't know how many it'll affect in this class, but I still like to bring it up. You never know in the future, you might need it. But you can also defer disaster or crop insurance payment. So normally you have to report when you received an insurance, insurance payout that year that you received the actual cash. However, let's say you produce corn grain and you typically save about 30% of your crop to sell the following year you can defer that much of that crop insurance payment to that following year, which is gonna reduce your current income level. This next one, number five, um, this may hit several of you and it's honestly um, one of my favorite ones to talk about. So timber sales. So whether you have purchased land already or if you're searching for land, if you purchase it and it has timber on it, or you think you're going to do timber on it eventually, the first thing you need to do is get a timber consultant out there and have them establish a basis or a starting value for that crop, which is timber, that's on your property. So the reason you want to do that is it helps you in the future when you go to harvest that timber, you can reduce it by that um, original value. So kind of thinking back to that form 4797, you're looking at it as a capital gain versus a full income. So this could be the difference. Let's say you don't establish a basis and you sell your timber for $80,000. You're going to pay taxes on that $80,000 versus 
If you have a basis and a value established by a consultant, let's say it was established at $40,000 when you bought it, you're going to be able to take that basis off of that amount and only pay taxes on $40,000 versus the 80. So it makes a very big difference. And again, you might not ever get into timber, but if you think you're going to, I would definitely um, go ahead and establish a basis value. Now, if you already have a piece of property, you've had it for 10 years, you didn't get a basis established, that is perfectly fine. Most timber consultants can actually come look at your property and kind of tell you the time frame of what it would have looked like 10 years ago. And they can do kind of a reverse basis value for you. So just keep that in mind because I don't I don't want y'all paying, you know, taxes on 80 grand when you can pay it on 40 grand. Um, okay, so this last one on this page at least, um, number six. This is called the Qualified Business Income Deduction. Fairly new program. It started in 2018, but it helps farms out quite a bit. Um, and pretty much every farm qualifies for this. The only thing that separates it is that you must have a profit in order to, um, to benefit from this program. So with this, what I call QBID, it's going to reduce your profit by 20%. That way you're only paying taxes on 80% of your profit versus 100%. Um, again, no profit means no deduction, but this is just kind of a gimme deduction and it just reduces your profit by 20% automatically. Um, and again, this is for farms only. So just one of those nice little tax benefits that again, if no one tells you about it, it's hard to know about it. Okay, so like kind exchanges, I'm not going to get too detailed in that because we don't see it very often, but it's where you actually trade real estate with someone. If you, you know, let's say you've got a house over here and someone has a piece of land over here, if you all wanted to swap, you could do that without having to pay taxes on it. So um, just a thought, but again, not, not very commonly used. So this next one, number eight, the trade-in of equipment. Um, this actually changed the game quite a bit in a good way, um, with, which doesn't happen very often with taxes, but this was a good change. So what you do in this scenario, I'm just going to use a tractor as an example. Let's say you take a tractor in to be traded in for a new one. What you would do is you would put the old tractor on form 4797, because again, it's a long-term asset, and you would only pay, you know, the capital gains tax rate on it. So you would put that old tractor separate from your new tractor. You're not even going to worry about combining those. The old tractor is going to go as a sale on Form 4797. It's not going to go on your Schedule S because we don't want to pay all those other taxes on it. Um, your new tractor, and this is where it really benefits us, the entire amount of the expense, um, if you don't want to depreciate it, that's kind of up to you. And that falls into the question that was asked earlier. Um, you can put the entire expense of that tractor on that same year that you bought it. And that's going to reduce your income level on that Schedule F by, you know, it could be 50, 60,000, depending on what kind of tractor you get. So it reduces that income and helps reduce that self-employment tax. So you get a benefit from selling your old tractor and a benefit from buying the new one. So it's kind of a, a win on both sides, which was nice. And of course, you can depreciate it differently if you want to spread it out over multiple tax returns. Okay, I'm not going to touch on net operating loss um, just because it, it doesn't quite apply to this um, to this class, but um, I do want to talk about reporting under long-term capital gains just because we saw a good example of this this past year with the drought that we experienced. So typically, again, going back to that form 4797, when you're selling livestock as a long-term asset and only paying capital gains on it, you have to keep the cattle and horses for 24 months and then smaller um, livestock for 12 months. However, there are some exceptions to this. One example is weather-related sales of livestock. We saw this um, tremendously this past year when 
The drought came through. Um, people, people were culling like crazy. They were trying to reduce the size of their herds um, to kind of get through those rough patches. So in that case, all of the breeding livestock that they sold early, they were still able to report it on Form 4797 because it was a weather-related issue. So they didn't have to put all that money they made from those animals on Schedule F. They were still able to take advantage of Form 4797. You can also do that with breeding livestock that you purchase that are found sterile. So if you, you know, you buy them, you're testing them, or if you are found sterile, you can still put them on 4797. Um, and then another one, this is more for people switching enterprises or maybe getting out of the business. But if you decide to sell your entire herd, any of the calves that you would have kept as breeding livestock can then go on form 4797. So um, again, most of us aren't at the end of the game yet. We're kind of at the beginning, but um, you never know if you want to switch enterprises and you decide to sell your entire herd. That's a way to kind of save you on some of those taxes that you'll have to pay. Okay, so that is all of the general farm tax reducing tips. I'm not seeing, I don't think any questions in the chat box. I know that was a lot to digest, um, but again, I didn't wanna leave any of these out because I didn't know um, how it could help um, someone in this group. So if anything, just keep this list for the future. Okay, so um, just a few more things. If you're, you know, just getting into farming, there are a couple of um, really great um, ag sales tax exemptions that we get. So the first one we're going to talk about is um, the Tennessee ag sales tax exemption. So this is a card that you can apply for and qualify for. And if you go and you purchase certain items, it's going to take that sales tax off of you. So if you go to the co-op and you're buying certain things, you aren't gonna have to pay that sales tax. To qualify for this, there are a few things that you have to meet. So it used to be as in, gosh, just a couple months ago, you could, your farm could bring in roughly a thousand dollars of product per year and you qualify. Well, it just went up this year. As of January 1, your farm needs to bring in $1,500 for you to qualify. So that's one of the qualifiers. Again, you don't have to check all of these boxes, but you do have to check at least one. So do keep that in mind. You don't have to have all of these. Just make sure you can have one of these. Um, if you provide for higher custom ag services, let's say um, you go and you kill people's gardens for them, or you plant for people, or you cut hay for people, that's considered a for hire custom ag service. So that also gets you qualified for that tax exemption. If you own land that falls under the Ag Forest and Open Space Land Act of 1976, um, also known as Greenbelt, a lot shorter, that also qualifies you for it. And I'll talk about Greenbelt in here in just a second. Another way is if you have a Schedule F that you have filed, that will also get you ag sales tax exemption as well. So if you don't have any of these categories, let's say you're so new to farm that you haven't even been able to make a sale yet, but you plan to do that soon, I would talk um, or send your plan to the commissioner of revenue because you can show them, hey, I'm in the I'm in the process of doing this. I'm already buying things. I do need this tax exemption, and they'll more than likely give it to you. They just want to know that you have a plan and you're moving forward. So I do have the link here for the Tennessee Department of Revenue as far as how to apply um, to get that. I also have it listed out the items that qualify because, of course, the tax exemption doesn't apply to everything. There's a specific list of things it covers that is listed on here as well. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not getting into char the charging of sales tax. Um, but there is a um, link right here if you're interested in looking at, you know, if you're providing a certain um, item that you think needs to have sales tax on it, it does talk about all of those things there. Okay, so kind of going along with the exemption um, property tax goes along right with it. This is the green belt. Now, what this does is this reduces 
the amount of taxes you pay on your land. Um, I do want to specify is it only lowers the tax value of your land, not buildings um, or houses that you put on your land. So just kind of know it only applies to the land that you have. Um, so you do have to have 15 acres minimum that either fall under agricultural, forest, or open space land. You have to bring in an average of $1,500 a year. That goes back to the exemption. They kind of have the same qualifications. Um, it's very easy to apply. We just, when we applied for it, we just went to um, our county tax assessor. He walked us through it and it was, it was a very easy process. I do have the green belt manual on here if you want to look more into it to see if you qualify. Um, but this is another great tax break that we have, especially um, with land taxes. It, it makes a huge difference. So I would make sure that you jump on that as soon as you can. All right. So um, again, I'm not going to get too detailed into this, but um, I have seen this happen. Um, as far as the IRS coming to audit or asking for more documentation, just because we're seeing a pretty big rise in beginning farmers, which is wonderful. Um, but the IRS wants to make sure that these are actually production farms um, and not just, I guess, what they consider a hobby farm, just because hobby farms don't get the same tax breaks as a production farm. So a few things they're going to look for. They're going to make sure that you have proof of a profit motive so that you have a plan to make a profit at some point. Of course, farms don't make profit every year. That's almost impossible, but they just want to know that you have a plan to do so. Um, they're going to ask for a business or a farm plan to kind of back that up. They are going to want to see if you separate your records and your accounts from your family living expenses. So, um, you know, I got asked earlier, when is too early to start record keeping? Um, it's never too early. So even if you're just getting started, I would go ahead and just open a separate checking. It can be at the same bank, but have a separate checking account for your farm. Don't put it all in with your family living expenses, just because um, that is something that kind of makes them look a little sideways at it. They're going to look to see, you know, are you taking classes or trainings to improve your knowledge of farming? So um, if I were you all, I would write down that you've taken this class because this is a training that you're doing. Anytime you meet with Matt or Taylor for a meeting, I would write down the date that you met with them because, again, that's you seeking out education. Um, <clears throat> And then they're also going to want to see, you know, if you have multiple years of a loss, they're going to want to see a plan as far as improvements you're going to make to switch it to a profit. Another thing that's going to flag them as well is high off farm income. They um, they will kind of take a look at it if you've got a super high off farm income, but you're using farm taxes as a deduction. So these are just some things they're going to look for. It's sometimes things that flag them. Again, we don't see it too often, um, but we have seen it a few times. So you just want to be prepared. It's nothing to be nervous about. You just want to make sure you've got the info to back what you're doing. So um, here I just listed out um, several just really good tax resources for you all. I've got um, the Farmer's Tax Guide um, by the IRS, which is wonderful. It is a long read, I will forewarn you, but it's a good one. I've got the Schedule S listed out. Um, if you are doing livestock and you want to know a little bit more about livestock sales, um, UT has a wonderful publication that you can look up and read. Um, we also have the Form 4797 that you can click and look at. And then I just put general tax season information on there, just as far as when it starts and ends for the 2022 cycle, at least. All right, so um, I'm almost done. So um, just some main takeaways from this class. Make sure to stay up to date on tax forms and know how to report on them appropriately. Again, um, you can save yourself a lot of money just by knowing how to report on these forms. 
Um, find and use the record system that works for you and your farm. Um, don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Um, use what you're going to actually get out and do. Make sure that your CPA and tax preparer are familiar with farm tax reducing opportunities because, again, those can really come in and help you out. And especially as beginning farmers, um, there's a lot of expenses, a lot of things we're having to pay for. So anytime we can get a break, we need to take advantage of that. Um, and then, of course, keeping good re records just in case the auditors do ask questions, you've got the information to back it up. And then, of course, utilize the resources that are available to you. Um, you all have Matt and Taylor in your county. Go to them. Ask them questions. Um, if you know of other experienced farmers, go ask them questions. Learn from their experience. Um, I can't tell you how many times I go out to a farm thinking I'm going to teach them something. And of course, they've been farming for 40, 50 years, and I end up just sitting there taking notes from what they're teaching me. So you just never know who you're going to learn from. And then, of course, you have us, like Matt said, um, your specific agent is less if you're in the Williamson County area. But um, of course, we're not too stingy. We all help everyone. So if you guys are in the north central part of the state, um, reach out to me. I don't mind to help at all. If you, or if you have specific questions from this presentation, feel free to reach out to me. But um, I just kind of listed out what we do. Um, we can help you review your current financial situation, help you look at your balance sheet, your income statement. Um, we can help you develop farm business and financial plans. So again, if you're looking at getting a grant or a loan or you just want it for your own personal knowledge, we can come out and help you write um, a full farm business plan. Um, we can help you analyze different alternatives you want to do on the farm. We can help you analyze different enterprises. Um, so we're just, we're here to help. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, and I think that is all that I have. So thank you guys for listening to taxes for the last hour and a half. I, I know it's a, it's a tough topic. So Thank you very much, Erin. Thank you for being uh, so informative. Uh, may not be a fun topic, but it's a real topic. And it's a it's a one of those required topics of life. So I appreciate your guidance and um, and the information you provide. Uh, just speaking to the group, Erin um, and, and her team of coworkers uh, provide a, an invaluable service that um, even half the time I don't even realize all the things they provide until I call one of them up and and um, and they were able to offer advice in areas I was uh, completely unaware of. So. Um, just ask the questions and we can find the answers and, and they are a wealth of information, whether it's just for your farm or sometimes if you just have a question that pertains to your to your personal life, they can also help in a lot of those. They send out a lot of um, just tax advice in general. So thank you, uh, Aaron. Anybody have any questions? Looks like there's no questions there. Any last chance for questions before we end the session? We will this has been recorded and we'll get it posted. And then we'll also include Aaron's uh, presentation along with that. All right. Thank you, Aaron. All righty. Well, thank you guys. Thank you.